I should point out, I think my evil twin brother... I'll just wait for you to turn that one off. There we go. I think my evil twin brother actually stuffed up my previous presentation and snuck in, so uh, I've come in to do the second one. <laughs> All right. This again will be a reasonably uh, visual presentation. I will try to keep still for the AV guys, so I got, I got told off for moving around too much last time. For those of you that were at my, my, my previous talk, I should warn you this one's not going to be anywhere near as funny, but I'll try to keep everyone entertained as much as I can. So this is about single points of failure, specifically related to a recent high PBX install at the Gladstone Power Station. There are about 10 high PBX sites that I know of at the moment, um, that's not counting the LCA machine here, uh, that are running high PBX, but NRG is by far the largest. I had a couple of pictures of the setup in my previous talk, but I'll go into some more detail in this one. And this one's going to be a bit more death by PowerPoint than last one, sorry. Anyway, single points of failure suck. If you just randomly pile things together, they're never going to be as reliable and stable as something you've actually thought about. Oh. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> the service we need to supply in HyperBX can be thought of as the bar along the top. If you take out any of the bars on the right hand side, you don't have a phone system. But taking out any of the bars on the left will result in no outage, or at worst, a brief one while it fails across, as long as the other node is turned on. Uh, I should warn you, I'm probably going to be switching similes a bit, and if you wish to throw rotten fruit, please do your best not to hit the volunteers, because they're not responsible for my terrible presentation. So let's pretend this is our phone system. We have redundant power supplies, one server, and one connection to the network. That's pretty obvious we need a UPS. And we probably need another server too. And we need to connect that to the switch. Yeah, perfect. Ah, it, it crashed. Uh, it turns out the couple of shell scripts you were using to copy everything backwards and forwards broke six months ago and no one noticed. But wait guys, it's cool, I got this. Oh yeah, yeah. now that's a high av system right there. <laughs> Maybe not. If you're not act actively planning for things to break, then you're not thinking highly available. When you're building your high-ave services, you should be planning for every item to break. Every single item. If this is what you look like, when that one power cable that you were sure was properly anchored is knocked out by a cleaner, you're doing it wrong. Because this happens, and lots of people are suddenly cranky. But you do need to spend a bit of money. If you're Scrooge McDuck, you can get the best hardware around. Or actually, he doesn't, he never spends money. So, you're Scrooge McDuck's rich son or something. I personally love the HP C-Class blade chassis, and I didn't even know that HP was sponsoring um, the conference until this morning. But I have two of these, and all the promises in the world don't mean anything until they actually start to break. And I've had a sh one of these chassis fail. And the only reason I noticed it was that the fans were running at 100% because the temperature sensors couldn't report back to either of the management controllers. I had to schedule an outage to get it replaced, but that's what scheduled outages are for. But they're not cheap, unless you pick them up on eBay like I did, and I'm sure HP would prefer everyone to buy them new because they sponsored LCA, but personally, stuff them. So you need to care about hardware. There's no use installing hardware that's unreliable all by itself. You need to start with a stable platform. But you have to decide on the limits of what you care about. At the power station, we cared about um, redundancy up to, but not including, destruction of the, of the PABX room. In a more traditional HIO system, you'd have physically separated servers and replicate across a WAN. But in a telephone situation, we have to care about volts on physical pieces of copper. If the room gets destroyed, the cables are destroyed. There's nothing we can do there, so we might as well stick it all in the same rack. Which is exactly what we did. Of course, this rack is now defined as a single point of failure. If we lose that rack, everything's gone. But we did decide this was going to be the level of, at which we cared. You can see that we have a pair of identical Dell servers, R510s, that are the high PBX cluster members. They're running CentOS 6, and in fact, these are the specific machines that convinced me to stop using CentOS 6 and move to Scientific Linux. Um, for anyone who wasn't at my previous talk, there's a pile of annoyingly trivial bugs that add up to a royal pain in the ass. The major one being that there's no kernel debug packages. So when a machine does crash, you can't find out why. The right slide is the UPS. It has four hours of battery backup in there, as that's the longest they ever expect to be without power. This is a power station. If there's no power there for more than four hours, the entire plant is on fire or has been decommissioned. So, on to the first part. Common sense. A single point of failure that a lot of people don't think about are the random hairless or possibly balding apes 
wandering around, poking their fingers in and changing stuff. If you have a pile of cables that aren't labelled and all look the same, you're going to have someone plug the cable into the wrong hole, which is of course a bad thing. You'll also see that we have a warm power supply and USB hub there. This is the first installation in Australia that has one of these, and quite probably the last. They're a total waste of time and money. Yes, they're good in theory, but the implementation of them sucks for various arcane and technical reasons that I won't go into here. Because then I have to start reading you my several page long emails to the manufacturer, asking them WTF they thought they were doing when they did X, Y, and Z. Their response could be summed up as suck it up princess. So, highly not recommended. This is probably just generic don't be an idiot best practices, but seriously, label everything. When your nice bonded network connection drops a leg because ETH3 has failed, it's going to be extremely handy to know which port ETH3 is. It'll be heaps of fun to discover that you just unplugged ETH4 instead of ETH3, breaking the cluster in half and causing an outage on your otherwise wonderful system. So, labels, common sense. You'll notice here looking at the cables that everything is spread as wide as possible. The trunked connections to the LAN are the blue cables coming out of ETH0 and ETH2. And the crossover cables are the red ones coming out from um, 1 and 3. Uh, unfortunately, you can't bond USB cables together. So we've got them across two USB cards, which yes, does double the potential possible failure but does allow us to do an emergency replug when one card fails and the second server is dead. I expect the machine to freeze or panic when a USB card does die, so Pacemaker will happily fail across to the other node and there'll be a tiny outage. A slightly different angle of the back, so you can see how I've got the cable set up to be as fault tolerant as possible, and you will also notice that the ETH1 sticker fell off the top machine. Luckily enough, there's a redundant sticker on the bottom, highly available. <laughs> I found this on Reddit the other day. This is a prime example of how not to build a high-ev network. I know that cables just tend to sprout, but if that was a high-ev cluster, where, where would you start? Like, no chance at all. With Velcro, keeping the cables tidy is important. It adds strength, keeps things tidy, and massively reduces the potential for something to be unplugged accidentally. I'm not denying that it takes time, and if anyone's seen my ad hoc cabling work, they will know that I am terrible. Um, but this is something you can't skimp on. One of the cool things about this project, working at a power station, is that there's plenty of smart people who already care deeply about single point of failures. And the project lead, Daryl, who is in the audience at the moment, suggested replacing the maze of 12 volt DC fuse cables that run to the astrobanks with a nice fuse block. That's what you can actually see the back of there. That's this here, the fuse block. Unfortunately, when I was taking these photos, I didn't think of this at the time, so you can't see a photo of the other side, but it re massively reduces the cable mess inside. Uh, awesome idea and definitely something I'll be doing in the future. But 240 volt power cables can be horrible beasts. They vib vibrate loose over time until one day, if you're lucky, you get an alert on your management console saying that a power supply has failed. And when you go to check, you discover the power cable is loose. Of course, if you're unlucky, when the power plug gets loose, it can start arcing, which leads to this. As a slight segue here, I noticed a really, really bad thing about this video. Um, well, apart from there being people whose office it is in a halon suppressed area. I found this video after doing, for, doing a search for halon deployment, and I was quite, quite astounded at what I saw. There's a couple of comments on the video, but um, I wonder if anyone else can, can spot what's wrong with the design of this. And, and please ignore the suicidal people who walk straight back in here after the halon's de deployed. You can see the problem now. Anyone uh, can have a guess? There you go. That's exactly right. Why on earth would you not cut the power? You've just had an electrical fire. Your vest has gone off. It's alerted. It's triggered. This this computer, this laptop here, the computer at the back, has still got power on it. I don't know what else has got power, but if that monitor was what caught fire, it's still burning. You can you put it out, but it's just started to strap back up again. So yes, this is possibly the worst Vesta system I've ever seen, including stupid people who walk straight back in. <coughs> I think the entire point of this presentation, uh, of you caring about spoffs, is that no one can ever take a photo of your installation and put this slide immediately after it. But what is the go with the hammer? Good question. The hammer is for two things. 
The first is probably the most important, but not the one you'd think of. Carpentry. If you're going to be, you're going to probably be spending a bit of money on hardware anyway. Don't skimp on the little things. Always run two separate circuits. These ones in particular come from different circuit boards, so a complete board can be de-energized and nothing will break. Of course, making sure that no one can trip over the cables is a significant bonus. While it's not a problem now, you've just installed your shiny new system. You know where all the cables are. But the next guy that comes in in three years' time and starts wandering around the computer room and moving racks is not going to know where everything is, is not going to be deeply invested in this, and he's going to trip over cables. So you want to avoid any potential future errors. And this may look like a bit, a bit of a rat's nest, but this is how we're taking 384 analog lines, uh, 720 physical pieces of copper, and distributing them over the power plant. We had this black rack mountable panel made with cutouts, cutouts for DB50 um, Tilco connectors. Telco connectors, the Telco connectors come from the rear of the Astra Banks and attach to the back of this panel. And the cables that come from the MDF, which is the ones you can see the front of here, plug directly in. Spending a bit of time thinking about the hardware can make your life a lot easier. This photo is unsurprisingly from the same data center as the previous one. I have no idea what that thing is dangling in the top left hand corner up there. And, and that's the last of my concerns. What's with the random rack of fans lying on top of another rack? And with the extra special super bonus, super safe front cover removed pedestal fan here as well. <laughs> if, if I ever come into your data center and it looks like this, I will kill you. <laughs> Carpentry is admittedly not for all of us. Some of us in this room, like me, have decided that sitting in front of a computer for 14 hours a day is a good idea and only venture out into that big room with the random air conditioning when it's absolutely required. But you need to be able to look at something and go, this is not a good idea. This is one of these times. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that everyone can understand that sucking air from a parking garage into a data center to cool... Oh crap. Someone didn't turn his phone off. <laughs> um, sucking data from su sucking air from a, from a parking garage to a data center to cool it is not the world's best idea. Again, if anyone has an excuse to put this slide up after something you've done, you're doing it so wrong it's unbelievable. But sometimes you need a hammer to do it right. When someone hands you a pile of old servers and says, "Make me something highly available out of this, will you?" Your correct response could be this. Or you could use it to make a highly available bookshelf. Or, or fix that annoying wobbly desk. It's far too easy to grab a pile of old decommissioned servers and go, eh, these will do. And sure it is, totally, if you're just messing around. But the entire point of a highly available cluster of machines is that the machines themselves are highly reliable too. So go wild. When you're messing around, grab an old machine, break it, but don't put it into production. If someone cares enough about something to make uh, to want you to make it highly available, then spend the extra couple of dollars to do the job properly. And just so you know, this is a couple of photos of the old phone system and its UPS. By moving to a high-ev, Linux-based, 100% FOSS phone system, not only have they freed up an entire room, they've got better reliability, longer battery life, and total control over what their phone system can do. Um, that UPS here on the, on the right, did that last four hours, guys? That was, that, was, that was four hours. So that entire rack on the left has been replaced by 8RU in the bottom of the, of the rack of the Hyperbix machine. That's pretty much it. It was just a short one. Thanks for listening, and I'd love to answer any questions. And, of course, to answer the most obvious question straight away, my favourite pony is, of course, Fluttershy. Any questions? Fluttershy. Fluttershy the... the well, it doesn't matter. It's the yellow one. Not featured there. Not pictured here. No, she's not. She looks a bit like a bit like this one at the back. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Possibly related to ponies, or maybe related to high air phone systems. Double face. <laughs> <laughs> Over on the right. Yeah, I got a question. It's not related uh, technically, but it's related. Is how do you deal with management that says, "Yeah, I want to HA stuff, but I don't want to put so much money in it." Like. What kind of uh, speech can you come to terms with, especially if they're technically aware and they're going to try to find a, the cheapest solution? Like, 
essentially they will offset the stress onto the systems manager being myself if something goes wrong because they didn't spend ex the extra dollar to make it a little bit more reliable. Well, uh, it's a matter of going, okay, you want a higher system, I need two servers and I need them to be, you know, atoms or, you know, reason I want mirrored disks. If they go, no, well, you go, this can't be a higher system. It's like, it's not expensive. This isn't expensive. The machines we had there didn't cost a big chunk of money. There's, there's, the hardest bit um, is actually, once you've built it, is not forgetting about it because it's so damn good. That's the hardest thing. And we had another question over there at the back. Um, in, in one of the earlier slides, you had a photo of the back of, of the servers. Um, yes. I wanted to ask what the red cables were for, the cross cables. Okay, that actually goes back to, sorry, I did somewhat assume that you may have been coming to my previous presentation. So these cables here, the red ones and the green ones, these go to the master and slave ports on the Astrobanks, which are, I'll find another picture of you, um, these things. So all those, all these boxes on the left here, these are all Astrobanks. These provide 32 analog ports per device. And with my talk prior to this one, um, when HyperBX fails over, the Astrobanks are smart enough to know which machine is trying to talk to it. So if it's running on the top machine, the top machine crashes, it's all, all the data is running through the red cables. The, re the Astrobanks realize the red cable or the top machine is not sending the data, and they start to listen to the green cable when the green cable is now has been failed over to the bottom machine, the green cable's in the bottom. I didn't explain that very well. <laughs> but yeah, it's for the high av stuff. So the, each, each of the Astrobanks have... Did I have a back photo with the back of the Astrobanks here? I don't think I did. I think it was in my previous one. Let me see if I can quickly drag a photo of that up. Probably not, actually. No, it's, it's buried on my, my laptop. But yes, so the idea here is having the red and the green, they're separate, totally separate USB channels, they're connected to different ports in the back, and different USB cards. Was it a question or just a wave? No. Just a wave. Anything else? At the back! There is only, the question was, is there only one UPS in that rack? Yes, there is only one UPS in that rack. But that's not actually all that bad because every single device in here has two power inputs. So what we've got is we've got a, the UPS feed coming in. I'll bring that PowerPoint back up here. That's exactly right, yes. I can't see the photo of where I had that. Anyway, there was a photo of two power points. So one of the power points goes directly into the UPS, and from the UPS it then feeds into one 240 volt rail. The other one doesn't go through a UPS. So if the UPS fails, we live off the live rail. If the live rail fails, we live off the UPS rail. And if the UPS fails, it's still running off the live rail. What if the UPS fails, it just fall That then is, gets back to... Um, I'll bring that the explicit size slide up. We consider that. That would be that. That would be that. That, 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 that single point of failure. So again, we cared about um, everything up to including destruction of the room, because the the cables we actually have physical cables here that we need to care about. There's 700, well, 384 pairs, and if those cables get damaged, there's you know. There's a massive amount of man hours to put them all back. And you can't access it from another side anyway, so you've got no option to do it Ex Exactly right. There's, there's no, nothing we can do remotely. Um, obviously, you know, this site has 350 SIP phones and 380 analog phones. So if those cables are destroyed, all we do is we just grab a backup, build a new HyperBX machine, copy all the SIP extensions across, and we're back up and running in, in, in a day, if that. But only with SIP. And we'd have no external connection to the world anyway because all our phone lines coming through that room as well. External phone lines. One more. Last chance. Going once, going twice. Thank you very much.